Hello, my name is Susie, and today I'd like to read to you something by the author Dan Jenkins, who is one of the greatest sports writers of our time and a wonderful novelist. You might know some of his books like Semi-Tough and Dead Solid Perfect. And he also was a great golf writer. In fact, he was very active covering the PGA up until he died in 2019. This, though, is an article he wrote early in his career when he was a sports writer at Sports Illustrated, and it was published in 1966. It's about New York's quarterback, New York Jets quarterback, Joe Namath, who is in his second season, and this is two years before Namath took the Jets to the Super Bowl, and you might remember three days before the game, he predicted that they'd win, and yes, they did. So this article is about Namath on and off the field, and it's entitled, The Sweet Life of Swinging Joe. Stoop-shouldered and sinisterly handsome, he slouches against the wall of the saloon, a filter cigarette in his teeth, collar open, perfectly happy and self-assured, gazing through the uneven darkness to sort out the winners from the losers. As the girls come by wearing their miniskirts, net stockings, big false eyelashes, long pressed hair, and soulless expressions, he grins approvingly and says, Hey, hold it, man. Foxes. It is Joe Willie Namath at play. Relaxing. Night timing. The boss mover studying the defensive tendencies of New York's off duty secretaries, stewardesses, dancers, nurses, bunnies, actresses, shop girls, all of the people who make life stimulating for a bachelor who can throw one of the best passes in pro football. He poses a question for all of us. Would you rather be young, single, rich, famous, talented, energetic, and happy, or the president? Joe Willie Namath is not to be fully understood by most of us, of course. We are ancient, being over 23, and perhaps a bit arthritic, seeing as we can't do the duck. We aren't comfortably tuned in to the mamas and the uncles, or whatever their names are, and we have cuffs on our trousers, and freakiest of all, we have pockets we can get our hands into. But Joe is not pleading to be understood. He is youth, success, the clothes, the car, the penthouse, the big town, the girls, the autographs, and the games on Sundays. He simply is man. The best we, we can do is catch a slight glimpse of him as he speeds by us in this life and hope that he will in some way help prepare us for the day when we elect public officials who wear beanies and have term themes to write. Right now, this moment, whatever Joe means to himself behind his wisecracks, his dark, rugged good looks, and his flashy tailoring, he is mostly one thing, a big celebrity in a big celebrity-conscious town. This adds up to a lot of things, some desirable, some not. It means a stack of autographs everywhere he goes. Hey, Joe, for a friend of mine who's a priest, a little something on the napkin, huh? A lot of TV and radio stuff, a lot of photography stills for ads and news and continual interviews with the press. Such things he handles with beautiful nonchalance, friendliness, and lip. Then comes the good part. It means he gets to sit at one of those key tables in Toots Shores, 1 and 1A, the joke goes, the ones just beyond the partition from the big circular bar where everyone from Des Moines can catch up, catch him while he's eating prime rib. It means that when he hits P.J. Clark's, the maitre d' in the crowded back room, Frankie Ribondo, will always find a place for him, while out front, Waiter Tommy Joyce, one of the New York's best celebrity spotters, will tell everyone, Joe's inside. It means he can crawl into the pussycat during the late hours when the Coba girls and the bunnies are there having their after-work snacks. 
even though the line at the door may stretch from 2nd Avenue to the Triborough Bridge. It means he can get in just as easily at two of his other pre-dawn haunts, Mr. Laughs and Dudes and Dolls, places long ago ruled impenetrable by Earth people or non-members of the youth cult. Easing into the clubs and restaurants that he frequents, Joe Willie handles his role well. Don't overdo it, man, he says. I can hang around till three or four and still grab my seven or eight. He sits, he eats, he sips, he smokes, he talks, he looks, and maybe he scares up a female companion and maybe he doesn't. I don't like to date so much as I like to kind of, you know, run into something, man he says. Namath is unlike all the super sports celebrities who came before him in New York, Babe Ruth, Joe DiMaggio, and Sugar Ray Robinson, to name three of the more obvious. They were grown men when they achieved the status he now enjoys. Might even be wearing hats. They were less hip to their times and more or less aloof from the crowd. Joe thrusts himself into the middle of it, their fame came more slowly, with the years of earning it. Joe Willie Namath was a happening. He happened first when he was a sophomore passing whiz who made Alabama coach Bear Bryant change his offense. He happened again as a junior when he proved to be such an away-from-the-field mover that Bryant had to kick him off the team for drinking and carousing before the last two games of the season. He happened again when he returned to take Alabama to the 1964 National Championship game on a gimpy leg. Then Sonny Werblin, the owner of the New York Jets, made him really happen when he gave him that $400,000 contract on the second day of 1965. No football player in history had ever been worth half that much. But this wasn't all. He quickly had to undergo an operation on his knee to have a torn cartilage removed and a loose ligament tied. And thanks to those splendid satirists, Robert Benson and David Newman, the hip line in New York became, Sorry, I can't make your party, Sybil, but I'm going to the tapping of Joe Namath's knee. He was already a celebrity then, but his image grew throughout 1965 when a certain amount of suspense built as to whether he would be drafted or whether his knee would allow him to play any football at all for Werbin's $400,000. During it all, the wisecracks flowed like cocktails. I'd rather go to Vietnam than get married, he said, as the draft board in his hometown of Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, requested that he appear for his physical. Then, after he flunked it, a lot of super patriots bristled, as they did at Cassius Clay's attitude. Joe said with brutal honesty, How can I win, man? If I say I'm glad, I'm a traitor. And if I say I'm sorry, I'm a fool. Once, when he was asked to point out the difference between Bear Bryant and jet coach Wee Bubank, Joe grinned and unwisely said, Coach Bryant was always thinking about winning. Weave is mainly concerned over what kind of publicity we get. When a writer tried to tease him about his classes at Alabama, asking if he majored in basket weaving, Joe Willie said, Nah, man, journalism. It was easier. When he was asked to explain the origin of the white shoes that he wore and still wears, during a game and now endor endorses commercially, he shot back, we bordered him. He thought it would save tape. But all of this was a year ago. Now in this season, as he goes about the business of proving that he is worth every cent of his contract, he has thrown nine touchdown passes and put the Jets in first place in the American Football League's Eastern Division through five games. He is becoming the quarterback that Werblin gambled he would be, a throwing artist who may eventually rank as the best, or with the best, and is still a swinger. Namath may be Johnny Unitas and Paul Hornan rolled into one. He may, in fact, be pro football's very own Beatle. 
He lives in a penthouse on New York's Upper East Side, one that features a huge white llama skin rug, an Italian marble bar, an elaborate stereo hookup, an oval bed that seems to increase in size with each glance, a terrace, and a couple of roommates, Joe Hirsch, a writer for the Morning Telegraph, and Jets, Jets defensive back Ray Abruzzese, who he knew at Alabama. Of Hirsch, Joe Willie says, I got my own handicapper. Of Abruzzi's, he says, I got my own bartender, referring to Abruzzi's one-time summer job tending bar at Dudes and Dolls. And of his apartment, he says proudly, I had the same decorator that Sinatra had paid for, for his pad. He whirls around the city in his gray Lincoln Continental convertible, the radio blaring and parking by fireplugs whenever possible, wearing tailor-made suits and tight pants and loud print linings, grabbing checks, laughing, enjoying life, spending maybe $25,000 a year on nothing, man, and wondering why anyone should be offended. I believe in letting a guy live the way he wants to if he doesn't hurt anyone. I feel that everything I do is okay for me and doesn't affect anybody else, including the girls I go out with, he says. Look, man, I live and I let live. I like everybody. I don't care what a man is as long as he treats me right. He can be a gambler, a hustler, somebody everybody else thinks is obnoxious. I don't care, so long as he's straight with me and dealings are fair. I like Cassius Clay, Bill Hartack, Doug Sanders, and Hornick, all the controversial guys. They're too much. They're colorful, man. If I couldn't play football, I'd like to be a pro golfer, but I like everybody. Joe's eyes sparkle as if he is getting ready to make a joke, and he says, why, I even like Howard Cosell. Joe Willie's philosophy is more easily grasped when one realizes what he lifted himself up from in Beaver Falls. It is a picturesque but poor town in the hills about 30 miles outside of Pittsburgh. He was the youngest of five children, and his parents were divorced when he was in the sixth grade. His father was a mill worker. He lived with his mother, and there was little money, so Joe hustled. He shot pool, he shined shoes, he ran messages for bookies. He hustled, he got by. Where I come from, he says, ain't nobody gonna hustle me, man. As he prepared for his senior year of high school, the idea of going to college was remote. An older brother, John, was a career man in the army, a warrant officer now in Vietnam. Joe was set on joining the Air Force and making it a career. What stopped him was a lot of touchdown passes and offers from precisely 52 universities, including Notre Dame, but not Alabama. I wanted to go to Maryland because I was stupid enough to think it was down south, he says. I didn't know outside Pittsburgh, man. All I knew was that I wanted to go south. I think a lot of kids from the East and Midwest do because of the climate. Namath took the college board exams and failed them at Maryland. You needed 750 and I scored 745, right? They wanted me to take it again, but I said to hell with it. He thought next of Penn State, but Maryland had to play Penn State the next few seasons and didn't want to face Namath. Maryland's coaches promptly called Bear Bryant at Alabama, whom the Terps would not play, and Bear welcomed, quote, the greatest athlete I have ever coached. Despite his dismissal for the last two games of his junior season, Namath worships Alabama and his experiences and successes there. Bryant is the greatest man, man he's ever known. Joe even has a hint of a Southern accent, his closest friends are from Alabama, and if there is anything that makes him mad today, it is the Eastern Press, which he calls the Northern Press. There are only three things I'm touchy about, says Joe Willie, who's naturally got that name down south. 
Number one, the Northern press and how it ignores Southern football when I'll guarantee you that a team like Louisiana Tech can beat about 80 of these lousy schools up here. Two is the publicity that Notre Dame gets. And three is the joke about the Hungarian. One other tiny thing that bothered him when he first went to the Jets after taking Alabama to three bowl games with seasons of 10-1, and 9-2, and 10-1, and 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 he read a statement by a pro player who suggested that Joe might not want to, quote, pay the price with his big salary. Can you believe that, he said? Why, you can't play for Bryant for four years and not know how to pay the price for what you get out of life. Considering that the most money Joe had ever made at one time before he signed the jet contract was $600, which he got for peddling some Alabama game tickets, he might have been justified in blowing the whole stack on a car, a blonde, and a diamond ring. He had a shrewd business consultant, however, in a Birmingham lawyer named Mike Bite. At Bike's bidding, he learned to spread the money out as he would an evening on the town. He takes only $25,000 a year in salary and will through 1968. He has $200,000 in bonuses working for him over the next 100 years or something like that and he was generous enough to let members of his family in on the loot. Two brothers and a brother-in-law are on the Jets' scouting payroll at $10,000 apiece a year. Contrary to popular notion, Joe did give the St. Louis Cardinals, who drafted him in the NFL, some serious consideration. And they weren't that far off in money, he says, but they had it laid out wrong like I had to do a radio show for part of my salary. I couldn't believe that. I said, man, I'm just a football player, and what I make will be for football only. He did guess that the Cardinals, who had an established passer in Charlie Johnson, might be dealing for him in behalf of the New York Giants, who had nothing, and one way or another, he wanted to, quote, get to this town. Bear Bryant's only comment was that Eubank had won a couple of championships at Baltimore, and if Joe was still interested in winning, he might give that some consideration. He wasn't a winner right off, of course. The Jets' 5-8-1 and one record last season made New York the worst team Joe had ever played on. Admittedly, he didn't know the first thing about quarterbacking a pro team. He had the quickest delivery anyone had seen, and he got back into the Jets' exceedingly secure passing pocket formed by Sherman Plunkett, Dave Herman, Sam DeLuca, and Winston Hill, his bodyguards, so fast that Kansas City's all-AFL lineman Jerry May said he makes the rush obsolete. But there was so much he had to learn. At Alabama, He had raced back only five yards and released the ball in approximately 1.3 seconds. Eubank, however, demanded that he get eight yards deep and go 3.2 seconds before throwing. His firmly braced knee prevented him from using the threat of the run, which he had done so well for two and a half seasons in Tuscaloosa. He had to er learn how to read defenses how to look for tips among the defensive backs, how to hit his receivers on the break, how to set up when he threw, how to call audibles, and how to convince his Jets teammates that he could lead them. Curly Johnson, the punter, said, Mainly, we wanted to see how good he was. He really didn't throw the ball that damn well for a long time. Now we know how good he is, the best. Says the ace receiver Don Maynard, At first, he'd knock us over on short patterns. Now he's slapped off. His timing is great, and he adjusts the situation like a veteran. To this, George Sauer Jr., another top jet receiver, adds, He never knew how to throw on the break last season. The ball was always either early or late. Now it's there. Not according to Joe Willie, though. I haven't thrown well since Alabama, he says. Maybe it's my leg. 
I don't know. If I knew, I'd throw better. You hear a lot about getting the ball up here by your ear, but that's junk. It doesn't matter how you deliver as long as the ball goes where you aim it and gets there when it's supposed to. I don't know how I throw the ball. I don't remember anybody ever teaching me to throw it. But there's a lot I have found out. For one thing, Joe says, the quarterback who has to call a pile of audibles, changing plays at the line of scrimmage, is a dumb one. You're supposed to know what the defense will be when you're in the huddle. I'll only call five or six audibles a game now. Last year it was more. That's funny, too, because the public thinks it's a big deal if a quarterback can switch plays a lot at the scrimmage line. That They, they think it makes him brainy. Man, most of the time it means he's stupid. Last year, says defensive end Jerry Philbin, there was an undercurrent of resentment. Nothing you could pinpoint, but it was there about Joe's money and his publicity. That was at first. It disappeared when everybody found out what a great guy he is. A simple thing it took Joe all last season to learn was that backs key on the mannerisms of a quarterback and cover their areas accordingly. For example, he says about 80% of the time when the quarterback takes the snap, turns and races back to set up with his back to the defense, he'll throw to the right. That's because it's easier, more natural, to plant your feet when you start that way. On the other hand, it's easier to throw left when you drop straight back without turning around. There are defensive backs who will play you for this, and of course, you have to cross them up. Among the defenders that have Namath's highest respect are Oakland's speedy Dave Grayson and Miami's Jim Warren, who was with San Diego a year ago. All you can say about them is they play you tight and cover you. To beat them, you have to run what we call progressive patterns. You know, something that goes out, slant, down and in. The whole game is trying to get the defensive man's feet turned wrong. Strangely enough, Joe finds that the ball has a tendency to turn wrong on his home turf of Shea Stadium. It's my unfavorite place to play, says he. Somehow, the wind swirls in there, and I don't like what it does to the balls I throw. It could be some kind of fixation, I don't know, like I have about throwing a night football. It's different, man, I swear. The coaches and the sporting goods salesmen say it's the same ball, but it isn't. It goes different. So does the ball in Shea. It certainly went differently in Namus' first home game of 1966. He passed for five touchdowns at the Jets as the Jets humiliated the Houston Oilers 52-13. Joe's hottest streak of all so far came in the fourth quarter of a game at Boston where he had, hit, had to hit 14 of 23 passes for 205 yards and two touchdowns so the Jets could salvage a 20-24 tie. This sent the Jets into pure ecstasy. He brought us back from a bad day in a real clutch situation, said Eubank. And publicity man Frank Ramos, with his usual sharp eye on statistics, pointed out, The papers are raving about Terry Hanratty at Notre Dame, but do you realize Joe hit as many passes in one quarter as Hanratty hit against Northwestern all day long? I think that's interesting. The super test for both Namath and the Jets came last Saturday, last Saturday night, and they were more than up to it. While Shea Stadium shook from the noise of 63,497 New Yorkers, an all-time AFL record, who had come to cheer their own town's only winning team against the unbeaten San Diego. Joe Willie's arm right was right when it had to be. He threw a touchdown pass to Matt Snell early that gave the Jets a 10-9 lead, which they carried into the last 10 minutes. Then, after San Diego pulled ahead 16-10, Namath rapidly fired three straight completions and whirled his team 66 yards to the winning touchdown and the final 17-16 score. He'd shown once more that he could deliver in the clutch, 
and the Jets had the only defeatless record, 4-0-1, in the AFL as proof. If there is a single myth that Joe Willie would like to have destroyed about pro football, it is the widely held belief that the game's quarterbacks are pampered by opposing defensive linemen, that they are not, quote, shot at, particularly himself, because of his bad knee and what his drawing power means to the AFL. Okay, he says, how about the Houston exhibition in Birmingham in August? Don Floyd comes after me after the whistle, and I move to miss a shot and re-injure my knee. What's that? Of course, Don didn't mean to. He says he didn't hear the whistle, and I believe him. But he was coming at me, and I kind of think of he'd hit me if he could have. What about the Denver game? I still got a wrist bandage and a sore back from that one. Johnny Bramlett, one of their linebackers, is a buddy of mine. He played for Memphis State, and he had me over to dinner the night before the game. His wife cooked an Italian feast, plenty good, too. But the next day, he was after me like a tiger, and he cussed me when he missed. He wanted to win, man. That's the way it is. I don't think any of our opponents are too interested in my health. If he stays healthy, Joe Willie may achieve his deepest ambition, which is, quote, to become known as a good quarterback, not a rich one. He may even become what Boston owner Billy Sullivan says he is now, the biggest thing in New York since Babe Ruth. Slowly, because trying to fathom youth is always a slow process, you get the impression that Joe is quite serious about it, and despite his hip ways, is working hard to make it. Beneath the gaudy surface, there's someone somehow beams through a genuine, considerate, sincere, wonderfully friendly, and likable young man. But he's going to be himself. He's going to do it his way and nobody else's. So I hope you enjoyed that story by Dan Jenkins. And just as a side note, Joe Namath is still out there making commercials, and he's 77 years old. That's it from now, and I'll be reading for you some more later.